Hello, everyone. We are so excited to give you a warm welcome to this webinar as part of the Google Podcast Creators Program. This is a partnership with PRX. I'm Brenda Salinas, and I manage the program from the Google side. Today's webinar is part of this open webinar series that we started with the training team at PRX. Experienced podcast professionals share practical tips tips, tricks, and takeaways in their area of expertise and answer audience questions. These webinars are recorded to be accessible for those who can't make it live. Google and PRX are committed to reducing the barriers to entry for podcasting, and we hope that this ongoing webinar series can serve as an evergreen resource. If you enjoy these webinars, please share them. And if you have suggestions for upcoming programming, get in touch. I've been an audio producer for 10 years, and it's incredible how far we've come with analytics. When I first started in radio, I was a producer at WKCR, my college radio station, where I had a news show. The only listener feedback I ever got was when people would call in to ask when the jazz was coming back on. When my stories aired nationally on NPR, my friends would text me, hey, Brenda, my mom heard you on the radio this morning. I'd answer back, great, what did she think? Then I started producing stories for Pacific Content, a branded podcast company out of Vancouver. They would upload my stories on SoundCloud and I'd see them get 70,000 listens. It blew my mind. And people could leave little comments along the way. It was very cool. Before being acquired by Google, we had a startup called 60DB. It was a personalized radio app where we ran some really co exciting content experiments. For the first time in my life, I had second by second analytics on my stories. At the end of the week, I'd meet with my editor and go through my data. We could see bad tape, weak intros, and I even started using a breathing technique that boosted my retention rate. We knew when we came to Google, we wanted all podcast producers to have access to great data. It really makes a difference. And later in this webinar, you'll hear from the product manager of Google Podcasts Manager, Steve Tannen, and you'll have time to ask questions. If you were to ask me what podcast team is using data in an innovative way, my mind immediately goes to Vox. I've had conversations with the team about how they measure audience engagement and how seriously they think about analytics. Whether you're running a national show or producing a hobby podcast with your best friends, understanding how to use analytics will help you get to the next level. And with that, I want to introduce Brandon Santos and Liz Nelson. Liz is the VP of audio at Vox Podcast. She's also led teams at Gannett and the Washington Post, where she covered pop culture. Brandon Santos is a marketing director of podcasts at Vox. He also led the podcast audience growth strategy for American Public Radio. You will first hear from Brandon and Liz for about 30 minutes, and then my colleague Steve Tannen will walk you through Google Podcast Manager for about five minutes. If you have any questions throughout the session, please put them in the Q&A chat area. There will be around 10 minutes left at the end of this webinar for Q&A, and we'll try to get enough time. We'll try to get through as many of your questions as we possibly can. Um, so now I'll hand it over to Brandon Santos. Thank you. And uh, let me just share my screen here. Um, and just to start, I thought we could just kind of explain our jobs a little bit. And I'll actually kick it over to Liz to just explain what, uh, what she oversees at Vox. And let me just share the screen here. All righty. Hi, everyone. It's really good to be here today. Um, really heartened to see this great attendance. So um, as Brenda and the slide uh, both communicate, I'm VP of audio at Vox and a, uh, a common uh, misperception is that Vox is Vox Media. We are a network within Vox Media. Um, and so I oversee the podcasts that are connected to the Vox.com news brand. So that is everything from Today Explained, our daily news show, which I hope everyone listens to, to the Weeds, Vox Conversations, and um, our most recent launch here that you can see on the screen, Unexplainable, a show about uh, science questions that, uh, that we are seeking answers for, but maybe the answers aren't always as patent perfect as, as we would hope. So um, as a part of this, I do everything from developing 
editorial um, and thinking about where we're going in terms of aligning with um, Vox's mission, which is to explain the news in the world, to working with Brandon um, and my colleagues on the comms marketing and business side to make sure that we are growing our audiences. And, and as we'll talk about today, a big part of that is partnering with Brandon and with folks like Brenda and the Google team to really dig into our audience insights. So we're looking forward to, to sharing more about that today. Thank you. And yes, I'm, I'm the director of marketing over uh, the entire Vox Media Podcast Network, which um, includes Vox, also includes uh, New York Magazine shows like The Cut, um, includes uh, The Verge, which has shows like Vergecast, um, Decoder, um, and several other uh, editorial brands within Vox Media. So my um, main job is to focus on audience growth. So growing our total audience, growing our total downloads, um, and uh, just building up um, that audience as much as possible. And a huge part of that is understanding our audience and understanding the data. Um, so that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, the, uh, key, the key kind of sections that we'll go through first is just setting realistic download goals. So like, what does success look like? How do we understand success in, in the podcast space? Um, second, some of the key reports and numbers to know, these are just some of the common ones that are often referenced um, when, you're, uh, when you're in the industry and, um, and the ones that you should kind of track regularly. Um, then we'll talk about looking beyond the download and um, what other data sources are available, what can be useful for you to get the full picture um, about how your podcast is performing. Um, and then we'll kick it over to the Google Podcast team and Svi will talk about uh, Google Podcast Manager and some of the um, resources and data that you can get from, uh, from um, the uh, Podcast Manager tool. Um, and then we'll open up for questions and um, it seems like there's already a lot of good questions coming through. So excited to, to hear from you guys and, um, and answer some of those. Um, so first, we'll start with just uh, setting goals for your show. And I think this is one of the most common questions that we get, especially when we're launching a new show, is just like, what, what does good look like? What, um, what kind of downloads should I expect? Um, and of course, the uh, answer, non-answer is um, uh, it depends. And um, different shows should have different goals. Um, on the right side, I've just listed, this is some data that Libsyn had provided. It, it's probably a couple of years old, but I think it still gives you a good context of like what the full you know, industry picture looks like. Um, and I think the important thing is, you know, there, there are a lot of podcasts in the world. It's a very competitive space and, they, and podcast downloads can range quite a bit. Um, there's a lot of smaller podcasts, uh, 50% have um, less than 123 downloads, according to Libsyn's data. 20% um, have uh, um, 1,000 down, or yeah, 80% have, um, have uh, 1,000 a thousand downloads per episode or less, et cetera. So it's really just that really top 1% where you're up over 30,000 downloads per episode. Um, and that's where a lot of like the bigger podcasts that you maybe know live, but um, your specific goals will depend on what you're kind of trying to achieve with your show. Um, I think a few things just to keep in mind when you're setting those goals is um, every show starts from zero. So, um, you, you know, it takes time to build up your downloads. And we often, when we launch a show, we'll we won't even really look at those numbers or share those numbers until we're about two weeks in um, or share them more widely so that we can um, give the show a chance to build up that audience. Um, second is that it takes a lot of work to attract an audience and that's partly why you need time to do it, but um, it's really important to take into account the number of people who you actually have access to. Um, don't expect the show to just for people to just kind of stumble upon it on their own. You do have to go out and, and get people. So one like very rough rule of thumb is think about the total number of people you expect to reach with marketing efforts, PR, word of mouth, um, whatever. And then assume that less than 1% of those will actually convert over to your, to your show. And that's how you can kind of think about um, you know, what, what realistic metrics might be for, um, for how much growth you can see over time. 
And then finally, you, you'll need to adjust goals as you go. So um, even the biggest publishers I know struggle to set, uh, you know, really perfect projections of how big a particular show will get. Um, and so it's important to kind of assess as you go and, um, and reset new, new goals and, and projections um, based on the data that you get early on. Um, the other thing that's important to know is that podcasts really grow on a curve. Um, so there's ton, this is just a, um, a graph of um, a bunch of podcast download data that we know from across the industry. These are not Fox Media podcasts, but just known podcast numbers um, across the industry. And you can see there's tons and tons of podcasts that live in this left side um, where, you know, they're much smaller. And then um, as you get farther along, there's fewer and fewer podcasts, but um, this is really, I think, a good way to think about your, um, how your show will grow as well. So getting uh, your first 10 to 20 downloads will be a lot of work, and then your next 20 will be a little easier as you get farther along. Um, once you get to, um, you know, 50,000 downloads, your next few thousand downloads will be easier to get. Um, but there is kind of a bandwagon effect that happens with your growth. Um, some of the reasons for that is just uh, larger audiences. You'll have more audience members to help share the show. Um, it also boosts your chart position. So that helps with discovery if you're um, high up in the charts. Um, as your show gets more popular, you kind of gain momentum as well in the press and best of lists, those kinds of things. Um, and then you also have more opportunity to do trades and promo uh, impression swaps and those kinds of things which can help boost your downloads. So I think a big lesson is just kind of stick with it. And, um, and if you're just seeing incremental growth, that will build up over time. Um, so what does success look, look like for you? Um, I think this, this, again, can range based on what your specific goals are. Um, a lot of people are doing a podcast because they have a community that they want to build and people they want to reach with their message. And they may be getting, um, you know, dozens of listeners or they may be getting hundreds of listeners and that's plenty. And that's, you know, an important community that they're reaching. Um, if you think about like one comparison I've heard is if you think about if you put on an event and had a hundred people attend the event to hear you speak, that would be you know, that's a great um, megaphone for your particular voice or message. Um, and those smaller communities can also create more opportunity for direct interaction, networking, those kinds of things. So um, some people, your goals might be in the hundreds or the um, dozens. Um, for other people, you know, if you're thinking about like creating a, subs a paid subscription program or using a tool like Patreon or something like that to um, to have people pay for your podcast, you can be very successful in the in with just a few thousand downloads per episode, um, because if you can convert enough people, that that can be you know you can drive a fair amount of uh, revenue that way. Um, if you are looking for scale and trying to grow to be a really really big podcast, um, and you're looking particularly to try to make money from advertising, um, I think the bar is a bit higher. Um, although there are exceptions. So one kind of rule of thumb is you should, ex if you even get an advertiser, you should expect to get two to five cents per listener that you get, which doesn't seem like a lot, but as you grow, as your show uh, builds up, that can add up quite a bit. Um, and then if you're in a specific niche, you know that there might be more flexibility there if you, um, if I know that there's a, there's a particular podcast about, uh, um, about parrots or something that can get a, that can find an advertiser for bird feed and they can do very well. So if you're in a particular niche, you might be able to find um, an advertiser for that niche. Um, but I think it is just for level setting, ad many advertisers won't really um, look at buying a show on its own if it's getting less than like 50,000 downloads per episode. So um, that's a, you know, a high bar to reach and it takes time, especially if you're um, you know, building a show from the ground up, but um, I think it's kind of important to know those expectations if, if uh, that's the, um, that's where you're headed. 
Um, so in terms of specific reporting and numbers to know, um, we'll go through a few just key kind of baseline metrics that you should, that I think are important to track. Um, first is uh, total downloads um, by day. So this is best for um, identifying sudden spikes and cliffs in your overall downloads. There are some limitations to looking at numbers this way. Um, the second we'll look at is total downloads by week. Um, which can kind of give you a bigger picture view of, um, of how your show is growing and changing. And then finally, uh, seven day and 30 day episode downloads, which gives you more of that episode by episode performance. Um, but before we kind of go through that, I think just want to note uh, a few kind of limitations to just the download and how we look at downloads. Hey, Brandon, too, there's a question that I saw in the chat and I know we're saving most of the questions for the end, but I think it's a good one is somebody's asking, um, Maria Fenwick is asking, what does download even mean? So if we could just like really quickly level set mm -hmm. that, that would be great. Yeah, that's a great call out. Um, so uh, it's a good question. There's the like official answer is a download counts if you're under the most common like uh, standard right now, a download counts if um, a person has downloaded at least a minute of your um, of your uh, audio file onto their device. So that could be that they've played it themselves and and then it's uh, downloaded the file that way. It could be that they downloaded it but not listened yet and then just have it on their device. It could be that they're subscribed and that has, um, because of their particular app that's um, downloaded on their device, um, you know, in the background for them to listen to later. All of those things count as, um, as an actual download. So that's kind of the official, official term. I think a lot of times people will equate a download with a listen, which isn't entirely true because you can download an, an episode, but like you may have it in queue to listen to later. Um, or you may not listen to it at all, but that still counts as a, as a download. And that is kind of like the main unit of measurement that's, that we, um, that most people reference. Um, and yeah, so just, just to jump back to, you know, what they can tell you and what they can't, um, again, can tell you how many times your audio file has been downloaded, doesn't tell you how much they actually like that show that isn't really enough data to, to give you, to tell you that. Um, it can give you a sense of how much listening of your podcast is growing or shrinking over time, um, but it's, you can't quite get at exactly what's causing your listening to grow or shrink. That will take some more detective work. Um, it can tell you how downloads of one particular episode might compare to another. But um, it can't, that doesn't necessarily mean that one episode is better than another or that people enjoyed that, that episode more than another. Um, and then it, again, the reason why we use downloads is because it does give you kind of a standardized sense of how big your listenership is, especially relative to other shows. But it doesn't tell you exactly how big your, your uh, listenership is, partly because of those limitations we mentioned. Like you can't always know if that's an exact listen um, sometimes people uh, also measure those downloads slightly differently depending on their platform. So it does give us, you know, as accurate as we can get, I think right now to, um, to get a sense of listenership, but um, especially relative listenership, but isn't like an exact uh, measure of, of total listenership. Um, so first one I want to call out here, first report, is just looking at your seven-day and 30-day episode downloads. So um, often when you are uh, looking at your analytics, you can get like an all-time download number. So how many times total has one particular episode been downloaded? Um, but uh, really it's best to look at the seven-day and 30-day as a better metric of um, of how one show compares to another. That's because if, a, if you just dropped an episode, you know, three days ago, it's probably gonna have a lot fewer downloads than an episode that's been out in the world for 60 days. Um, so this kind of looking at seven day and 30 day will kind of help to normalize, um, uh, help to normalize, uh, you know, that comparison. Um, it, the seven day is also useful because about 
half of your downloads will come in in the first seven days. It depends on your particular show. Um, these, these are kind of dummy numbers that we're providing here. These aren't real podcast numbers from us, but um, you know, in this case, uh, you're seeing seven day numbers on the left and 30 day numbers on the right. And you can see seven day numbers make up a big, big portion of that 30 day number. So you're getting a lot of downloads right up front and then less as time goes on. Um, the other thing to know is advertiser rates are often based on a 30 day or sometimes a 42 day um, window after a, an episode has launched. So that's another reason why that um, number is important. Yeah, and as Brandon pointed out, like the seven versus 30 day, and he mentions in the uh, in the text to the left that the 30 days do give you a more complete read, especially for long tail listening and evergreen shows. Um, but it is important to note that like this chart will look different depending on what kind of show it is. Like, so when I'm looking at the numbers for today explained, like I expect to see the first seven day downloads be really high and, and really approaching kind of what the overall 30 day is. Although we do have a lot of episodes that are more evergreen in nature that you know we we do get a bit more of a long tail out of with other shows like unexplainable that we launched recently that we very much see as a show that you know a listener could like get as much out of like this week and a year from now like we are i i am hoping to over time see like a much different slide than the one we're looking at right now where we really do see that 30 day extending the listenership beyond what we're getting in the first week. So um, I just wanted to make sure that like you're not looking at this and thinking this is what it should look like for every show because it really depends. Absolutely. And again, we'll have uh, time for questions at the end too to, to dig into these a little bit more. Um, the other uh, kind of metric that I think is that you'll be able to see pretty easily in most of your analytics from different um, hosting platforms is just the, the daily, your total daily downloads. Um, and this is just an example of uh, a graph. So it's to total number of downloads across your podcast um, by date. Um, this can be useful to see like particular spikes or sudden drops. Um, uh, so like if something happened, like let's say you had a big um, uh, appearance on another podcast or you um, had a big mention on in the New York Times or something like that, you might see a sudden um, jump up in your downloads. Um, but one of the limitations here is that it's pretty noisy data. So you can see there's a lot of ups and downs day to day. You typically will see a big spike on the day of your episode drops and then it'll start to decline. Um, so episode schedule can you know, hugely impact those numbers and it can kind of be difficult to um, get the full context just from looking at the day by day downloads. Um, the other thing to know is your is daily downloads tend to drop on the weekends. Overall, again, it depends a little bit on your episode schedule and your particular show, but that's another factor that will just affect these day-by-day uh, -day numbers. And we have seen some variability in these numbers since people have been largely working from home throughout the pandemic. So the spikes that we were seeing like on release date and even like down to release time, which you can also get, um, were much more pronounced prior to the pandemic, but now we see listeners kind of sparse like parsing out their listenership across the week for many of our shows so where we have a show like unexplainable we're seeing listenership that's pretty steady from day to day throughout the week at least so far but we're only about a month in um so just to get a little bigger picture for it i think looking at downloads by week can, can often give you a better lens um partly because it flattens out some of those, uh, you know, day-to-day -day spikes and, um, and can give you just, again, a fuller picture of, of what's happening. This is especially useful if you're on a regular episode cadence every week. So you drop every Tuesday and Thursday, or you drop every Tuesday. Um, so it's a little bit less noisy. And this is just like a example from one of our shows um, about how it helps you kind of track how the show is changing over time and how, um, how different you know, moments in time may have affected your downloads. So for this particular show, we had some big episodes that covered the market crash. Um, and those were like a particular moment in time where our show is super relevant. There was a big spike. Um, there was a slump once people entered quarantine. 
um, when behavior across all of podcasting was down. Then we had a big appearance on a major news network by one of our hosts, and that drove attention to the podcast again. Um, and we also had some, you know, uh, social and PR activity during that time that helped to drive up our downloads. So you can kind of see how um, the pace of your show will ebb and flow over time tied to those kind of specific moments. Um, of course, if you drop more episodes in a particular week, you'll also see an extra spike in your downloads as well. But this is, again, just another way to look at the, the um, bigger picture. Um, and then the other question that often comes up is like, okay, what, what drives those spikes in downloads? What has the biggest impact and what um, what are the potential causes for some of the cliffs you might see or drops in downloads you might see. So um, obviously this can differ quite a bit. There's tons of factors that are all layering on top of each other to drive your downloads. But um, a few common ones that, that we see when um, episode downloads spike, um, one would be if you suddenly get a uh, featured placement from one of the major platforms. So maybe you're included in a collection of um, their favorite podcasts of the week or something like that, that can often have a direct moment in time impact on your downloads. Um, second would be like a major uh, press mention or maybe um, you got tweeted by a major celebrity or something um, and that can, or a minor celebrity, uh, that can help drive, um, drive extra uh, downloads and sometimes you can see that moment in time kind of spike up. Um, also guest appearances on other pods, if you, as the host, or if the host of your show is um, on another pod, that can uh, often uh, lead to spikes. Um, also just the broader news coverage, um, uh, relevant news events. So obviously we have a lot of politics and news shows. And um, when, uh, for example, when there were the Capitol riots that, um, caused a lot of interest in news content that wanted to get new, you know, get perspectives on that event. Um, so a lot of our uh, shows in that category spiked during that time. Um, and then of course, if you drop extra episodes again, that you'll see um, a jump in, in downloads for that reason. Um, these are the things that often cause like noticeable immediate jumps in numbers, but there's also many other factors that can contribute to growth that maybe aren't as spiky as all of that. Um, if you are seeing uh, the uh, um, seeing any drops in downloads, um, it could be that you know a particular marketing effort ended. It could be a problem publishing a new episode. Um, so make sure that you're seeing your episode populate across all the platforms. Um, it could be that an episode was pulled from a platform, or there's some platform specific issue. And it also could be changes in listener habits. So I noted before for. The that other show, when when people first entered quarantine, we saw podcasting drop a lot because um, people were no longer commuting. And um, so that was kind of a, a cliff that we saw uh, that has kind of recovered since then. But um, that could, uh, those external factors can also contribute. Um, so last thing I'll, I'll jump through here um, quickly. And again, we'll be able to answer questions at the end. Um, but it's just that there's a lot of other data outside of just straight downloads that's really useful for, um, for creators. Um, and probably the most important one is this qualitative data, um, which is like audience feedback, reviews, um, which can come from a lot of sources. It can come from Apple Podcasts. It can come from social media. It can come from emails directly to you. But um, even though it's not really quantitative, um, like it's not straight numbers, um, it gives you a lot more context for um, what people are liking, um, what they're disliking. Um, it also can help inform how to talk about the show, like how to message the show, because you can kind of pull out um, some of the words and phrases people, external people use to, to talk about your um, podcast. So this is a really, really important source of, source of um, data about your show. Um, the other thing to note is, you know, obviously looking at one review at a time, that's not enough to say that that's a trend or that that's how everyone thinks. You'll tend to get kind of polarized views where you'll get people who love it, some people who don't like it. Um, but if you get the same feedback from multiple listeners, I think that is something to pay attention to um, because there's probably a lot of other people who, um, who would echo that, who aren't, you know, leaving you that feedback. 
Um, another important one, which we'll talk about a little bit, like how to access this, but episode consumption data um, is also uh, a really useful way to look at your shows. So um, this is showing uh, as people listen to the episode, how many people are dropping off at different points. So this is one example of a show where um, you can see right at the beginning when people were hearing ads, people had dropped off right here, pretty consistent with a little drop off um, till about midway through the episode, we had another ad break. So people dropped off there. And then, um, you know, we had fairly consistent listening again with some drop off before the very end where we were losing some people maybe in the credits or the post roll. Um, but this is useful, especially when you compare episode to episode to see like, are you able to um, retain listeners throughout the program? Is it, it, are you maybe the right length that you want to be at? Um, and again, your goals will differ depending on the show. If it's like a really loose show and it's okay if people drop off at the end, um, you, maybe you don't mind if there's a bit of a slope. Um, if it's like a serialized narrative show, you probably want people, you probably want it to be flat so that people are getting to the end so that they'll come to your next episode. Um, but yeah, I think this is also super useful as we evaluate shows. Um, this is accessible within individual podcast platforms. Um, and then another one we get questions on a lot is uh, the podcast charts. So what drives position on those charts? Um, how important are they? And we don't know the exact algorithm or anything about how Apple Podcasts in particular and even other platforms work in terms of how they surface um, particular shows at the top. But we do know that it's, it's not a measure of your total downloads. So the shows that you see at the very top of the list aren't always the absolute biggest shows in the world. Um, it's more a measure of um, momentum, so recent activity around a show. So that's why new shows often will um, jump in the charts faster um, because it will, uh, those shows are gathering new listeners and having a lot of activity from new listeners in a short amount of time. Um, the best estimates, and this is all kind of like the, the podcast or rumor mill, but um, I think we have, there's some data to back this up, um, is that the last three days is kind of the window that they look at. So if you're getting a lot of new subscribers in that time, um, a lot of new downloads in that time, that will uh, um, drive you up the charts. Um, and of course, one of the reasons why this is important is that the charts are a useful discovery mechanism for new listeners. So people will go to the um, to a particular category and um, find their next podcast um, at times. So um, I think this is important to, to know. And again, this is like based off of um, loose data that's kind of gathered throughout the industry. It's not necessarily the, um, not all of this is like public from Apple. Um, and then the last one, this is like a quick summary. There's probably more we could say here too, but um, the there's, a, plenty of other data that you can get from um, your hosting platforms and from specific apps. So um, a few of them that I think are, are interesting to look at. One is location of your listeners. Um, where are they more centrally located? And especially comparing that to population um, is useful to see like, um, you know, is, is it especially popping in my local area? Um, are there, uh, you know, is it more of a, um, show that's like more West Coast than East Coast, et cetera. Um, and also which platforms are driving the most downloads. This is also helpful for figuring out if, um, you know, if your show suddenly spike, was that just on a particular platform, which might mean that you were featured on that platform or is it kind of universal? Um, and then finally, uh, a really interesting one from Google Podcasts, which we'll talk about in a sec is um, uh, the most common search terms driving discovery within Google. Um, which is really interesting. This is um, just an example, uh, some example data from within Google, but um, I thought it was interesting that like we did a Britney Spears episode and that spiked um, or showed up in the search results. So just uh, you can get some interesting data through that um, Google podcast uh, tool. And with that, I will pass it off to uh, Speed to talk about um, to talk about Google Podcast Manager in more detail. Awesome. Thanks, Brandon. 
Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Svi. I'm a PM on the Google Podcast team, and I'm uh, really excited to be presenting a walkthrough of the Google Podcast Manager. Uh, so for context, uh, Google doesn't maintain a directory of podcasts like some other platforms. Since we crawl the entire web, your podcast is actually already included in our app, which is really great news because it means that, uh, you know, when we launched, we were able to have uh, coverage of the entire uh, open ecosystem of podcasts from day one. Uh, this also means that uh, when you register your pod or when you uh, claim your podcast on Google Podcast Manager, it's likely that we already have some data about how people are listening to your podcasts. Uh, in fact, if we do have some data, we will we'll be able to show you the last 30 days of activity of your podcast on our different platforms. Uh, and for context, we have uh, clients on all the major platforms. We have an Android app, iOS app, and a web client. And all of that data gets piped into Google Podcast Manager, uh, which I can uh, walk you through right now, and you'll be able to see a little deeper analytics on. So let me just share my screen. Okay, here we go. So this is what Google Podcast Manager will, I'll say it's, yeah, this is working, right? Okay. So this is what Google Podcast Manager will, will look like if you uh, have never used it before. You can just go to podcastmanager.google.com uh, and you'll get to this uh, splash page. So if you want to be able to look at analytics for your podcasts, you just go to start now. Uh, it'll ask you to enter your, your podcast RSS feed. So this is going to be the RSS feed that you've uh, shared on, on, on other platforms. And uh, Google will have uh, almost certainly have already crawled it before and hopefully we'll have some data for it. So I'm going to enter a test feed right now. You'll see a little preview of your feed. So we'll parse the RSS feed, be able to extract the title description, some cover art. Uh, Ozen, by the way, is uh, Hebrew for ear. And it's uh, because this product is built out of Tel Aviv. Uh, our, our engineers had a little fun with our test feed. Uh, if I go to the next step, uh, sometimes uh, if, so in this case, the feed that I'm claiming on Google Podcast Manager matches the Google account that, I, that I'm signed in on. Uh, so this is a special case where we get to auto verify you. But if you uh, are using a different Google account than is on your RSS feed, you'll go through this uh, send verification code. And just like any other app where you're uh, verifying, uh, uh, verifying your, your email address, it'll send you a code. Uh, the email that I'll send it to will be the owner email inside the RSS feed. And this is pretty easy to edit on, on all the podcast hosting platforms, but, uh, or I'm sorry, we call it the owner email. I think it's publicly, it's called the, the contact email. Uh, and so we'll send, and the reason why that we need to verify ownership is because, you know, I, I, like uh, we don't want uh, anyone to be able to see analytics for any feed. Uh, you know, so uh, we want to make sure that we only give access to the actual uh, people that control the RSS feed that you're claiming, which is why we require that verification step. So if I go, so in this case, because my email matched the email on the uh, owner field for the RSS feed, it auto verified me and I can just press submit. It will say ownership verified, fantastic. Uh, and, you know, because I haven't listened to Brandon's talk yet about how to grow my audience, this unfortunately has has no data because uh, no one is listening to this test podcast. But if I go over to uh, our test account, you can see that uh, this is this is what the this is some of the uh, listening data from talks at Google. So another thing, so and and this is what your page would look like if you actually had uh, uh, listening data for your show. An important thing to call out here is that we don't talk about downloads on Google Podcast Manager, and the reason why is because uh, since we're showing analytics for uh, podcast consumption that occurs on our clients, we actually ground everything in terms of plays. Uh, because plays is a much more meaningful metric for for uh, for podcasters, and since we have 
uh, much deeper insight into how people are consuming your episode, it's it's a little bit easier. Uh, it's better to orient around. Now, from your podcast host, you know you'll be able to see traffic um, from all major platforms. Uh, on Google Podcast Manager, we're only showing you since we only have data for people listening on on Google Podcasts on either Android Web or iOS. We're only showing you a small subset of uh, of your overall traffic, but uh, trends uh, and listening behavior on Google Podcasts uh, can be uh, carry over to the other to the other platforms. So here you can see the overview of plays in in, in the past two weeks. You can see minutes played, subscribers, uh, which is a new feature we added, and and this is only subscribers on any of the Google Podcast clients, not overall. Hopefully, you have more than 330 subscribers. So if we are to look at, so, so this is the show page. Uh, if you register multiple podcasts, uh, if you're an owner for multiple podcasts, you can add more uh, right here and you can switch in between your, the different shows that you've claimed on Google Podcast Manager. Uh, and then I guess, right, one other important thing to note is in the settings pane, you can see what feed Google is currently serving for your podcast. Uh, and this is important, you know, if we got this wrong, you should uh, definitely contact support, but this is the actual data that we're reading from uh, on the web to be able to, uh, reading on the web uh, that we actually show in, in, our, in our different clients. Uh, one other thing to highlight on the show page is you can see a breakdown of different devices that people are listening on. Uh, you can see traffic from Google search, like Brandon mentioned, you can see uh, uh, different search terms that led people to your podcast and top discovered episodes in the past 28 days. If, I, if I'm going to jump into, uh, let's see, we can go to this one. We can jump into the episode detail page. Uh, since we have like a second by second understanding of how people are listening to your podcast, uh, we can offer these really great detailed retention curves. Uh, like Brandon mentioned, you know, if you have ad breaks, you you might see some dips there. Uh, in this case, Toxic Google doesn't have any ads, uh, and so we see you know a little bit of drop of at, at the beginning, but overall pretty smooth retention curve all the way down. Uh, and then this gives you plays for this episode and total minutes played over time. You can also see uh, uh, how this episode, like you can also see discovery analytics for this specific episode. Uh, and what search terms led people led people to 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 listen to this? Um, all right. One other thing I wanted to highlight is you can export. Oops, where's my mouse? You can export your listening data by going to a little uh, snowman over here uh, and click download CSV. That'll give you a CSV of stats just from this episode. And then if you go to talks at Google. Uh, and you go, I'm, oh, I'm very satisfied with the product. Uh, if I go to talks at Google, I can actually download uh, a CSV of stats from my entire show. Uh, and you can export these stats to, uh, and be able to combine them across multiple listening platforms to get a better understanding of how, how your podcast uh, is performing uh, on, 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 on different podcast players. And I think that is everything I wanted to go over. So I'm gonna hand it back to Brenda, who is going to start the Q&A. Thanks, Fee. Um, so let's start with uh, an easy one. Brandon, can you talk about, mention the 1% conversion rate that you talked about? Oh yeah, I had, I had noted that, um, you know, when you think about like your marketing efforts across, uh, you know, social activity, or maybe you're buying audio spots like for another show or doing some kind of trade or whatever. I think a, a rule of thumb number, but is not, this is not like a golden rule, but a 1% would be like a high conversion rate for most marketing efforts. So, um, so when you think about like, okay, how many people should I expect to actually move over to this pod? If I'm, if I'm uh, like, let's say I'm, my social post is reaching a hundred people um, you're probably only going to get like one of those to move over or, or maybe less than that. Um, so it's more just to put in context, like it, it really is about getting a lot of reach to 
do with your audience um, in order to convert people. Now, sometimes you can convert people more directly. If you just go tell a friend um, to listen to a podcast, you probably have a lot higher than a 1% chance of getting them to do it. But um, but yeah, it's just kind of a rule of thumb to, to give a sense of the scope of reach you need to get to move people over. Right. Um, and I'm seeing um, people are craving for us to define the terms again. Um, what's a download? What's streaming? What's an impression? What's a subscriber? Can we give some good working definitions for, for these terms? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So <laughs> I, I think like one way to think about it is like what people count, call a download is really a, um, a file request of your MP3 file that exists on a server. So whenever someone hits, and so that, that request can come in a lot of ways. It can be someone hitting play on their podcast app. It could be someone hitting download on their podcast app. It could be their podcast app automatically going and downloading a file because they're subscribed to a podcast. All of those count under downloads. Um, the When you talk about like uh, streams, um, so like in Spotify, for example, it's typically a stream that um, that you're doing. You're not, you're usually not like downloading a, an episode for later. Um, that's a stream is like a live play. So, um, but that also gets added into your total downloads. So that's all part of the um, collection of downloads. Streams are one type of download that can happen, but you can also have automatic downloads. You can have kind of download for later downloads. Um, but yeah, a stream is more of like, I'm going to download a little bit of this episode at a time while I'm listening. So it's happening live versus I'm downloading the full file um, to listen to later or to listen to immediately or whatever. Yeah, I think yeah, uh, just yeah, one other detail I would add there is uh, if you're looking at stats on Spotify or Google, uh, it's important to check. So Google does not rehost any of your content. So anytime that you press play or press download, we will register any listening activity in Google Podcast Manager, but those download stats will still show up on your hosting provider. For Spotify, Spotify rehosts some podcasts and doesn't for others. So it's good to double check uh, to make sure that you're not double counting uh, uh, downloads and streams that happen on Spotify. Yeah, and to that point, I'm seeing a lot of questions about how do you parse out all the data from different podcasting platforms that you're getting? Um, how do you translate that into something that's useful? And are there any aggregators or any you know services that you would recommend? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. I think the generally this the main sort like the aggregator of your download info should be your hosting platform. That should be your um, your truth for for like your aggregate number for like what's my total downloads because Spotify can give you Spotify downloads. Our friends at Google can give you Google Podcast, uh, you know, downloads, plays. Um, and th that's also useful to look at, but then you're just looking at that one platform, which is probably, a, you know, some set percentage of your total downloads, but your hosting platform will get all, will, should get all of those downloads from every platform aggregated. So that should be kind of your source of truth. Um, you know, we use Megaphone, other people use Podbean or, you know, other um, hosting platforms and like you should check that they're meeting IAB requirements so that you're kind of on par with um, with other publishers. But generally that is like the, the true source of overall downloads. Can you talk about IAB, what it is, IAB certification? Yeah, so um, IAB is kind of like the um, group that sets the standard or that's kind of set standards across, you know, digital media channels um, for uh, for measurement and kind of accountability for um, for digital publishers and advertisers and stuff like that. So they've set some guidelines around um, how people uh, should count um, downloads. And the reason for that is like before, if um, before there were any like set standards, people could just, if you um, clicked on an episode accidentally um, and only downloaded like a kilobyte of the episode and obviously never listened, people could technically count that as a download. Um, 
it, they also, some of those standards also help them filter out bots and things like that that, that um, can skew your numbers. So it's a, it, they're a, um, they set the bar for like how you, sh what actually should count as a download so that you're, you know, cleaning up some of that messiness. Yeah, and importantly, it's it's the metric that is considered the gold standard by advertisers as well. So it makes sense for us to all kind of like opt in to IAB's measurement standards. I really like um, this next question. Can you talk about a time where Box used data in editor editorial decision making or in you know making a leadership uh, call on a show or something like that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, data is so crucial and important to everything that a digital organization does. And um, we are continuing to see more specificity and nuance in the numbers that we're getting as the years go by, which is great. You know, one of the one of the um, slides that Brent, Brendan showed earlier was the um, you know how 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 much uh, of a show listenership is getting through, and there are only a few platforms that are providing that, including Google, to us um, thus far. And and to me, like that metric is a really important one because with downloads, as Brendan said, like we aren't sure like if that is actually like a valid listen. But when we're able to start looking at that subset of like how far people are getting into a given episode, that really is like we 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 can be confident that these are people who are listening to the show and really. Draw a lot more nuance from them. So, um, so like I can't underestimate the value of us um, being able to access that information. That said, it's like it's one point that we look at when we're thinking about making editorial decisions um, and uh, and and helping to chart our course for the future. There was um, years ago when I uh, was in a previous life in digital news, like a big quote that got thrown around a lot was Tony Hale talk from Chartbeat talking about um, data being like a lamppost that helps you like shed light on the questions that you really need to ask. And, you know, it's, it's not the answer and it points you to asking the right question. And so for us, that's very much um, the, the philosophy in terms of what we're getting from these numbers, but we like to combine it with anecdotal as well so that we can start getting what we hope is a much more complete almost like a forensic investigation of our listenership. So we might start with something like seeing a drop off in listenership to a show. Um, and that becomes a question for us to then answer, why is this happening? And so we can then kind of zoom into the numbers and see like, are there insights that we can draw from digging deeper into some of the metrics that are provided by the platforms and by our host um, in terms of where that listenership is coming from. Was there a specific time that it fell off? Like that could easily answer the question. Like we produced something that just really missed the mark or turned off an audience, or it was because there was a platform failure um, and our show didn't load on a particular platform. We can find that out. If it's not that easy to answer, then that's when we get kind of more into looking at things like how long do people get through episodes prior to that to see like, were they starting to like really check out at some point before we saw this like abrupt stop in listening. Um, and then that informs us being able to ask the right questions of our audience, which we do often. Um, you will hear in Vox shows quite often our hosts asking listeners to write us, um, whether it's on social media or at specific email addresses to tell us what did you like about this show? What didn't you like? Are there things that you want to hear? Um, do you have ideas? Like all of that. And we find that our audience um, and podcast audiences tend to be like orders of magnitude more engaged than just like digital website uh, audiences. They will respond to that. And, and that provides us with the opportunity to, and I saw somebody asked a question about audience surveys, to look at opportunities about doing things like audience surveys. And um, between Brandon's team and my team and our, our audience insights team, we do some pretty regular check-ins with our overall podcast audiences. We're getting ready this summer to launch another kind of broad podcast audience survey that we ask folks who we know listen to opt into, but we will do deep dives into specific shows um, as well. And then, when we're thinking about kind of like next steps in terms of like what shows we want to launch. Um, a good example is Unexplainable. We launched that as a pilot within Today Explained. Um, wanted to see how it did there, but um, it, we were very aware of like the numbers not telling us whether or not that pilot was a success because we were running the show in a feed that 
has a built-in audience for Today Explain. Um, so we very much wanted to uh, find out what the audience thought. So we actually did a focus group with that audience, which is something that we have access to at Vox, where we were able to bring together a group of people to talk about the episode, what they liked, what they didn't like, and draw more conclusions from there, which is a very long-winded way of saying um, that data is very helpful in, in, in figuring out what we're going to do next, what we stop doing, what we start doing, doing but it is, it's one factor in the decision that we make. I think that's a great point to end on. Uh, we are out of time. Thank you so much, Liz, Brandon, Svee. Um, I know I got a lot of the, out of this and based on the questions and the lively discussion in the chat, I know other people have too. Um, all of you who are listening in, if you, know, you found this helpful, please let us know and please share it with other people that you collaborate with. We would love to get everybody talking about analytics and tuned into our upcoming webinars. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. Um, I want to say good afternoon from New York, but you know, you are all, all over the world. So wherever you are, thank you, and we'll see you soon.